What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you a review of the Fatesworn DLC for Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning. A little while back I actually reviewed Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning after getting 100% on it. That review actually did very well, it got about 75,000 views. And as such with any of my reviews after 100%, I do typically go back for any DLC that gets released and at the time of that review, we were still waiting on an announcement or anything about the Fatesworn DLC that was promised with the remaster that Re-Reckoning was. So that DLC finally released on December 14th. I spent some time with it, got the rest of the achievements knocked out. Now we're going to talk a bit about what that DLC adds to the game. And the overview of those things are, of course, the brand new story to go along with the DLC, a new area to explore called Mithros, about 33 side quest and faction quests, discounting the new storyline, chaos dungeons, new weapons, armor, enemies, raising the level cap to level 50, and new music. So to start this off, after playing through all of it, I will say this. The main problems of Kingdoms of Amalur, the base game, are still there for the most part, which is normally what you'd expect for this kind of thing. However, they did try a lot of new things with this DLC that I think turned out very well. A lot of the side quests and things were much more interesting than a lot of the base game stuff, in my opinion. And while the main story of the DLC isn't amazing or anything, honestly, it does, however, draw what I would consider to be a pretty definitive end for the Fateless One, or the main character of Kingdoms of Amalur, which I'll talk a bit more about at the end. But as you advance the main story of the game, you're going to get access to new weapons, armor, and these Chaos Dungeons. Now these actually kind of go hand in hand, because once you get access to the Chaos Dungeons, you'll start fighting Chaos Enemies which are just new variants of old enemy types, that is to say, Bogarts, Niskaru, etc. However, now they will have a Chaos Armor Bar that you have to eat through first, which can only be affected by Chaos Weapons. You'll get Chaos Weapons by first, of course, going through the main story of the DLC, but as you do that, Chaos Portals will start to pop up across the entirety of the world map, and these portals will lead you to many Chaos Dungeons, and completing them will grant you a variety of rewards rewards including the ability to craft your own chaos weapons, which are hands down the best weapons in the game, and also the only thing that can damage chaos enemies. As part of the main story, you're going to handle a few of these, but in total there are 25 chaos portals, and the more of them you defeat, the stronger you can make your chosen weapons. Now if you're not any good at crafting, they actually did build in a way to get around this. There's an NPC that will do it for you based on how many portals you've closed as the potential for your weapons goes up with each portal closed. Now beyond this, when it comes to new armor and weapons, there are several new item sets for the DLC as well. These item sets were actually linked to several of the achievements for the DLC actually. This armor, much like the weapons, are the best you're going to find in the entire game, which makes sense as this story only takes place after the main story of the game ends. But these sets will do things like summon in extra enemies, give you buffs and things, and just do things you didn't see armor do in the base game. For instance, one armor set will actually allow you to parry block breaking attacks, so attacks you wouldn't have been able to parry or block previously, you can now do so in. And in fact, it got to a point where with one of the new armor sets, I just was not taking damage from enemies, which was always fun to play around with. But to circle back a bit and talk about the story before we kind of just wrap this general little DLC review up, one thing I often say about Kingdoms of Amalur is that I think the best thing for the series would just be to make a new game, because Kingdoms of Amalur, being what it is, didn't really get much of a chance to shine. Now, everything past this point, I am going to talk a little bit about spoilers for the main game. Nothing egregious, but a bit about the fate of your character. So if you don't want to hear that, maybe click off. But that said, to quickly sum up my thoughts about the DLC before we jump into the spoilers, overall the DLC fits in very well with the base game, continues the story, kind of wraps up some loose ends if you will. The side quests, as well as the armor, etc., and the mechanics of the game are, in my opinion, some of the best stuff the game has to offer. 
And considering how long ago the base game came out, I think it is impressive how well they integrated this with the rest of the game. Now, to jump into the spoilery part. The crux of the DLC is that you are investigating Telagras, the Chaos God, who has shown up, apparently, since you defeated the main antagonist from the base game. And apparently in doing so, your character started to cause the tapestry of fate to unweave, which is causing problems, which is where all these chaos enemies and everything are coming from. And at the end of the DLC, it is decided that your character needs to leave Amalur and basically go to a different continent because your very presence here and your role as the Fateless One is causing problems that there is no way to fix. So they just send you away to a continent where they are hoping the magical effects there will cause some suppression of your abilities. Now, in my opinion, this is just a way of shipping off your basically godlike hero at this point. So kind of regardless of your feelings about the DLC as a whole, it kind of marks a definitive end for the Fateless One at the very least, and probably most importantly sets up potential options for a sequel. Now, I don't know if there will be a sequel, but if there is one, this ending, in my opinion, gives them the most flexibility with what to do with the game because they could, for instance, actually pick up with your character in this new continent if they wanted to, or they could re-envision the world of Amalur and allow you to be someone new that isn't the Fateless One. And in my opinion, again, it just opens up more options. But to wrap this whole thing up, the DLC itself is $20 if you don't already have the edition of Re-Reckoning that came with the DLC. I think it was called the Fate Edition, but individually looking at it by itself, if you do all of the content that the DLC has to offer, I think you're looking at about 15 to 20 extra hours of content. And for 20 bucks, that's not terrible. Personally, I would have preferred a price more around the $15 mark, but having never played Kingdoms of Amalur before these reviews, I actually bought the Fate Edition of Re-Reckoning, so I just didn't have to pay for the DLC when it came out on the 14th because I paid for it when I paid for the Fate Edition. It seems like a good addition to me. But there you go, guys. There is a look at the Fate Sworn DLC for Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning. Overall, I would say my views of the game as a whole remain mostly unchanged. As I mentioned, a lot of the problems from the base game are still present, but the expansion itself is a lot of fun. You get to mess around with some very high-level gear, which is honestly impressive, and makes the combat fun to mess around with. There you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.